recording of the slides. Okay, so uh, during our last session, I, I began coverage of uh, hidden Markov models, but in so doing, I discovered some, some issues uh, that confronted um, the presentation there. And specifically, there were some inconsistencies in notation that threw off um, an interpretation um, and made confusing some of the uh, some of the examples that I provided. So uh, I wanted to, because this material is so foundational in terms of basic understanding, and because it will serve as the basis for a take-home exercise this week uh, conducted in R, uh, I wanted to uh, briefly review the essential problems that we're taking on, and then uh, go through a set of corrected and elaborated um, and refined slides there that I'm hoping will be more uh, tutorial uh, in their character and will will give a, a much better sense both symbolically and in terms of uh, even in terms of some of the practical components for uh, conducting uh, work with, with hidden Markov models. So with that preface having been offered, I'm just going to jump into uh, the set of slides here. Uh, okay, so hidden Markov models um, have, uh, as I noted last time, broad potential application in infectious diseases but in many areas outside. And, and they depict this common circumstance, a situation where we have a small number of mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive discrete categories. Uh, we'll soon be transitioning to state spaces on Friday with approximate Bayesian computation where we have continuous state of a system. What we're positing here is discrete state of a system. So uh, we're in an outbreak state or a non-outbreak state with respect to uh, foodborne illness, or with or we're in a, a state of um, a major depressive disorder, um, borderline depressive disorder, or or um, in a in a state absent uh, depressive disorder. And the idea here is that we have observations which are individually ambiguous, noisy. Um, sometimes episodic, uh, only available occasionally. And, and in any case, uh, at any one time, those observations are, are uh, inconclusive in terms of cluing us into what state of the system we're in. So we might see a set of observations of clinical cases being reported. Um, and any one number from the clinical cases, say a number of about uh, 30, could be an indication that an outbreak is going on, but it could be also very consistent with, with the situation absence and, uh, absent an outbreak. Uh, if we see 40 uh, cases uh, on a given day of clinical presentation, or say a given week in, in a hospital's uh, presentation consistent with foodborne illness, um, that could suggest an outbreak, but it could just be an unlucky situation with, uh, without an outbreak situation. Um, so any one observation, 30 cases, 40 cases, and any one day is inconclusive as to what state we're in. It doesn't point directly to that state. But collectively, if we start to look at successive weeks, they might start to clue us in into whether an outbreak's in place uh, at this, at the current time, or was in place historically looking back at a given time. Uh, that's the idea. And uh, we're seeking to make use of information, not just that's coming in at the current time, but in previous times uh, to clue us into what's going on now. But we're, we're seeking to do so also taking into account the fact that the underlying situation is changing. So we may have an observation, say, five weeks ago that had an extraordinary number of clinical cases being reported, say 50. 
uh, which would suggest to us a very high likelihood of an outbreak compared to a non-outbreak state. But, but that was five weeks ago, and we're interested in knowing what's the situation now. So we need to discount that observation from that, to, to, that long ago because the situation has likely changed out or might have changed out from underneath us. Um, so uh, we're seeking to, to infer what's going on, locate the state in which we're located uh, at any one time. Um, and there's a set of questions addressed using these techniques. We won't get to all of the techniques for exploring all of these, but in the take home exercise, you'll be exploring more, um, some additional ones beyond what we cover today. Uh, we're gonna focus today on, on uh, the question on what state are we on we in right now, or what state were we in in an earlier time? But it turns out with these methods and uh, maximum likelihood approaches, for example, we can, uh, seek to determine how often are transitions made between states? What are those states and how many of them are there? How much time is spent in different states, et cetera? Um, okay, uh, we are dealing with, just as a reminder, discrete states, whether it's three or five or two or 10, we have a set of categorical possibilities where, that are collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive. We're in exactly one at a given time. Uh, and over time, we transition between them. Um, we're also dealing with discrete time. There are hidden Markov models that operate in continuous time. Uh, and there, what we're dealing with is something that has a direct analog and differential equations, which we'll be talking about on Friday in the context of approximate Bayesian computation. But here, and in the vast majority of uses of hidden Markov models, we're exploring discrete time points. So we might be dealing with a given week at a time, for example, and we're trying to understand for that week, uh, were we in uh, a foodborne out illness outbreak? And you can define that any way you want. Was there at least one day where there was a foodborne illness outbreak? Was there any foodborne illness outbreak in that week? Were we entirely in a foodborne illness outbreak during that week? You could choose what it means for a week to be characterized by a foodborne illness outbreak. That's a matter of definition. Um, that's just a matter of labeling. But given that definition, we'll deal on a week by week basis um, and and uh, attempt to understand for a week as a whole, what was the situation there, um, according to whatever consistent definition we want to use. Um, okay, now we will further be making a simplification, which is very common within the compartmental modeling area. And I believe I noted it at one point, during our discussion of compartmental models. Uh, when you're in a compartmental model, stocks as they're called in system dynamics or compartments or state, a given state uh, within a, uh, a compartmental system. Let's say the, the uh, infected state. Uh, if that's represented as a single compartment, uh, there's a memoryless assumption there that those within that state are well mixed um, and our chance of leaving per unit time is independent of how long we've been in that state. Whether we've been in it for one day or one week, um, our chance of recovering in the next day is a certain, a certain quantity. Um, that's not to say that chance of leaving can't be changing over the overall time of the model. It's just that it can't depend on how long we've been in that state. That was true for compartmental models and it's gonna be true here. Now that sounds like a very, very strong assumption um, that you know, our chance of leaving per unit time uh, is 
independent of how long we've been in a state. Um, but the truth is that typically we can address it readily if there is a concern by dividing that state up um, and having a chain of states, for example. So you might have early stage infection and later stage infection, and one only recovers from later stage infection. Um, sometimes one might have three such divisions, et cetera, uh, often called third order delays in the context of, of system dynamics, for example. Um, okay. Um, and uh, we further make the assumption, you may recall, for hidden Markov models that uh, our current state uh, is, is all we need to know in order to assess the probability of observing a given outcome. So when we saw that earlier, um, earlier diagram here, the idea is that contention on being an outbreak state, we have some distribution uh, of say the number of clinical cases we observe in a given day. And, and we treat this distribution as, as allowing independent and identically distributed draws from it while we're in an outbreak state. In other words, um, our next draw from, from this depends only on the state we're in. Um, it will be different for a non-outbreak state than for an outbreak state and not the value we got last time. Um, so any dependence on the last observation is just factored through state. It, it's just a result of being in a certain state. So being in a certain state of say an outbreak, we can draw independently from this distribution or in a non-outbreak state, we can draw independently from that distribution. And once again, that may sound like a strong assumption, but we can in practice often finesse that uh, lessen how tightly it binds us by breaking states into pieces, you know, early outbreak, late outbreak, or what have you, um, in a very pragmatic way. Um, so conditional on being in a state, the likelihood of observing certain observations uh, is, is held to be independent. Uh, it depends only on the state and not on the last observation. Okay, so with a hidden Markov model, we have a set of possible states, a set of possible observations. For simplicity, we're going to assume that it's the same no matter what state we're in. In other words, we can have the, the same types of, we have the same types of observation, say clinical and subclinical cases, regardless of whether we're in an outbreak state or a non-outbreak state. And then we're gonna have this transition matrix which we're going to denote with this capital gamma um, Greek letter there. Um, and that's going to be a matrix which is going to tell us, given we're in a certain state, what's the probability that we're going to transition to each other state? Um, and we'll be taking a look at what that looks like in, in just a moment. Uh, but it bears noting that it, each row of it will, will sum to one. We're going to have pi, which is going to be this probability of initially being in each state and a count of observations, T, of total observations. Okay. Um, so, uh, for example, we might be have, have three states here, whether someone is smoking right now, vaping, or no use. This was inspired by some work we do with smartphone-based data collection, where we were classifying people's behaviors as recorded by consenting individuals on our on smartphones um, with an eye towards better understanding, say, the dynamics of smoking behavior, um, potentially also to, to help anticipate ahead of time and work to, to dissuade an individual. But a lot of it was to understand how uh, how's people's behaviors uh, might serve as risk factors for health conditions. Um, so here we might have three states um, and the transition matrix will therefore be a three by three matrix. 
Now, one of the dimensions will indicate the the current um, the current uh, state in which someone is located, and the other dimension. So the 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 rows are going to indicate what's the current state. So I'm in a state, say, of no use right now, and the columns will indicate what's my probability of transitioning to each other state um, in the next minute. So for example, if I'm in a no use state here, um, I have a 0 0.003 chance of starting to smoke in the next minute, the next one minute. Um, and I have a 0 0.007 chance of starting to vape in the next minute. Um, and if you add those up, you'll find that they're equal to 0 0.01. And I have to go to some state. And so the rest, the 0 0.99 is just, I remain here. I remain in the state of no use. Great. Um, uh, similarly, if I'm in a smoking state right now, maybe this is a bit easier to think about. If I'm in a smoking state right now, I have a, based on the duration of smoking, a bit over five minutes, I have a 0.18 chance per minute of, of going into the no use state. And I have a, uh, a chance here of going into a vaping state directly of 0.02. Um, and uh, so maybe this person goes inside and wants to, to vape inside. They can't smoke inside, but maybe they can vape in a private building. And so they, they go do that. Um, but otherwise they remain in the state. So you'll notice the diagonal entries all indicate remaining in the current state. That's the probability remaining in the current state. And these other off diagonal probabilities indicate um, the probability transition from one state to a different state. Important thing, every row sums to one. Um, remember the rows represent your current situation and you've got to go somewhere. Um, uh, and so they have to sum up to one. You've got to go to either this or that or that. Um, okay, so that's the idea of behind this transition matrix. Um, Okay, um, so the idea here is that um, this can be used in um, in two separate uh, two separate ways. Um, so uh, one way is what's called supervised learning, and here we have trained we we train the model uh, to to best match some data uh, that we have. And the data is special data that it's labeled. So maybe we've gone through, through observations, third-party observations, to record someone's true smoking status for a small set of volunteers for the course of two days. Um, we have data from the smartphone on them, and we have observations from a trained observer who records, who actually diarizes, records observations saying what they were doing at a given time. Uh, and with that ground truth data uh, or labeled data about what they were doing at any time, we train a model to, to recognize um, the occurrence of smoking by finding the HMM that best fits that data. It's trained on that data um, in a way that, that best matches its patterns. Um, and here, uh, we can often do so in a fairly routine way. If we don't have to worry about missing data, for example, we could just look at this data, we could calculate the probabilities of transitioning from one state to the other. And, and we can use that to, um, uh, to figure out what, what, what are the transition probabilities. In other words, we could see, okay, when someone smokes, uh, how long is it for? And how often do they go on to vaping afterwards? How often do they go on to just no use? Uh, 
And we can encode that in our transition matrix. Um, and uh, we could do so uh, for every other state as well. Um, and uh, having, having recorded where everyone, what's everyone in the small set of, 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 of observed individuals is doing at any one time, we can also figure out what are the smartphone fingerprints, as it were, the, the signals from accelerometers and from gyroscopes, et cetera, that would be associated with someone smoking versus not smoking. So we might note, for example, from G the strength of GPS signals and Wi-Fi signals and the temperature recorded by the phone, whether someone's likely to be indoors or outdoors and use that to sort of clue us in better as to whether or not they're smoking. We might look for rhythmic movement in them just standing still outside for a period of time. And that might clue us into to them uh, being smoking. And we can kind of find the, the, the signs as it were of, of smoking being in a given state. In short, with supervised learning, uh, if we put aside the issue of, uh, of missing data, which we can deal with uh, through uh, what are called EM algorithms, uh, we can often fairly readily arrive at a, at a hidden Markov model. Now you might ask, why would we do that? I mean, if we have to observe everyone, what's the use of using the smartphone? Well, having arrived at that HMM, of course, we could then have a vastly larger group of people participate in cell phone studies of, of, of smoking behavior and only and use the HMM to deduce for those people what, how often they're smoking, um, how, how frequently uh, they, they engage in smoking, for how long. We can use the classifications from the HMM that we trained using supervised learning to classify things. So um, we'd go through, we'd, we'd uh, train it on a set of data and test it on a different subset and rotate. And this is called cross-validation. It's going to be a, uh, it's a notable part of machine learning that tries to arrive at a model that has, um, uh, that has uh, generalizability, that's not hardwired for, not uh, overfit to a certain set of data. We train it on one subset, we test it on another, and then we rotate again and again. Now for hidden Markov models, this is, and, and indeed for a lot of our, for virtually all of our uh, temporal methods, this is a little bit more complicated because we can't just break this data up at any point. We, 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 we can't just, for example, train it on data before and after and then test it on this, having not looked at this in the first place. So a common thing to do is to sort of train it on a prefix of data and then test it on the balance of the data, train it on this other prefix of data, test it on this other, et cetera. Uh, what I like to call temporal cross-validation. And it reflects the fact we can't just pluck out um, some data from the middle of a time series and say, you know, go, uh, uh, go reserve that for testing only and train it on things on either side. These are methods which are temporal in nature. They depend on contiguity. Okay. Um, so I'd like to um, go into uh, the, uh, a little bit more detail. I, I will note, and, and I apologies, I, sh I should have emphasized this. When mentioning supervised learning, the alternative is unsupervised learning. Now in unsupervised learning, which is the most frequent use of hidden Markov models, we don't have privileged observations. No one's going around and taking a look at the, the people carrying the smartphones, what they're actually doing right now. They're not doing it for a subset of people um, that are used to label um, to produce ground truth data. We don't have that ground truth data. All we've got is observations from a whole bunch of people who are carrying the smartphone. And we're seeking to infer the HMM structure. Um, we're seeking to arrive at an HMM um, 
that best explains the patterns of the data. Uh, and that HMM uh, is something that we're going to try to deduce through maximum likelihood method um, of observations. And uh, when we have missing data, we'll generally make use of what's uh, what are called uh, EM algorithms, or entropy maximization algorithms. Um, having, having done that, having kind of observed this data, these patterns in the data, and, and arrived, explored different HMMs that might explain those patterns, trying different sets of numbers of states, different transition probabilities between them, um, different observation profiles for each state, we might say, okay, this HMM best explains those patterns. This HMM most, most uh, with highest fidelity, it reproduces those patterns. And we then use that HMM. I would note that this is a technique we'll use again and again for our subsequent method. HMMs are particularly simple to think about. We have these discrete states, transition probabilities, not temporal probability densities. Uh, but the basic thought process here um, that we want to arrive at a characterization that will reproduce the patterns we see in the data as best as possible. Uh, is something that flows through many of these techniques. And it comes out in perhaps its most uh, expansive and popular form right now with deep learning models, um, where we are trying to create generative models, models that will reproduce patterns um, in an emergent fashion without being given structural guidance ahead of the time. But we'll see this can play a role in particle filtering and approximate Bayesian computation in a way uh, in particle MCMC. Um, the same basic philosophy comes out. You know, we want to we wanna capture these patterns and we want to use a model that best reproduces the patterns while accounting for theory in the meantime. Um, uh, it's deep learning that tries to kind of move beyond needing to impose theory on it. And there's some other techniques as well that can deduce differential equations from, from data. Um, but, but the techniques we'll be surveying uh, in this course uh, predominantly deal with uh, differential equation or agent-based method um, type modeling type characterization. Okay, now I'd like to go over an example here. And this is where the notation got screwed up last time. And um, there were some confusions about the uh, inconsistencies with the probabilities of what was shown in the diagram and then the notation. And I have to apologize for that. I've gone through and cleaned up the slides and I think we're in good shape now uh, for a consistent characterization of it. And I'd like to walk through this example. It has quantitative specific understanding and it's based on this this example that I talked about in the opening two minutes of this presentation. So we, we imagine a situation where we're dealing with foodborne illness outbreaks. And we have two possible states, we posit. A situation where our city involved has, is, is not in a current outbreak state, state A, and another one where it is in a current outbreak state. And what we posit, is that for each of those states, we're gonna have a corresponding number of cases that we expect. So in, you know, if we're operating at a city which has an active foodborne illness outbreak, by and large, we're gonna be expecting more cases of highly credible gastrointestinal illness in the hospital. Um, and uh, here we might see a mean of somewhere let's say uh, uh, about 25. Whereas if we're in a non-outbreak state, people are still gonna be getting highly credible gastrointestinal illness from the Norwalk virus, from uh, 
various types of stomach upset from alcohol use, et cetera. But we might on average expect fewer of them. Now remember, any one data point um, may be very ambiguous here as to what it is. For example, if we had 20, that could be on the low side for an outbreak or on the high side for incident cases. But that's what a hidden Markov model is designed to deal with, this ambiguity. Um, the point here is that we have a separate distribution. And importantly, for the coming notation, I'm going to call this P sub A of X. In other words, contingent on being in state A, I have this many incident cases that I expect. And this, similarly, we have one for state B, the outbreak state. Contingent on being in an outbreak state, I have this many. And remember the assumption of a hidden Markov model on which I expounded not 10 minutes thence, which was um, that this distribution is contingent only on, it's conditional just on being in this state. Um, it's independent of what was drawn last time as, as long as we know the state. It, it just depends on what our current state is, uh, what, what distribution we draw and it's IID. It's independent and identically distributed given in being in a certain state. So we have a distribution for each of these here. We expect more cases. So the distribution uh, stretches further to the right. Here we expect fewer. Um, OK, um, we have one week epochs. And we're interested in knowing at a given time, let's say the current time, shown in red here, is there an outbreak going on? Um, and for simplicity here, uh, and we're going to go beyond this in the take home exercise, we're going to assume a certain hidden Markov model structure. Um, in the take home exercise, you'll be exploring different hidden Markov model structures uh, uh, that might explain the data and which one might explain it best. But here, we're going to uh, be focusing on the case of how we get to understand how well does it explain it. Uh, so we're going to posit a hidden Markov model structure with these observations and with a transition matrix characterized by this here. So the point nine means, or let's take the point one. It says contention on being in state A, the non-outbreak state, I have a chance of a 10% chance per week of going into an outbreak state. That's the point one. And remember the rows add to ones. So this is 0.9 here. I have an, if I'm in a non-outbreak state, I have a 90% chance of, of staying here. Um, the only possibility of staying here or going here, this is 0.1, so it has to be 0.9. Uh, similarly, this transition matrix says, if I'm in an outbreak state, that's the second row here, a 30% chance of going to a non-outbreak state, of changing states, going from B to A, note the notation, or I have a 70% chance of remaining in state B. Sorry, folks, We're, we have some acoustic um, interference here. Um, so, um, so this indicates the probability of transitioning between states. Um, for epochs. You should be familiar with that from that earlier example with smoking and vaping and no use, but that's the basic idea. Okay, now um, we're going to walk through a little example where we're going to start in state A, the non outbreak state with probability 0.75, and state B with probability uh, 0.25. So we have a 75% chance of starting here and a 25% chance of starting there. And you could recently ask, how do we know that? Um, and uh, I tell you a few things. Number one, what I tell you is actually that assumption typically gets washed out very quickly. What I mean by that is the if you want to understand the probability, the what state you're in a time fifth at, at this time here, four states in or four time points in. Um, it's probably going to be only modestly affected by that early assumption of what in what of the probability in what state we're going to start. Um, that's one thing I would say. Uh, it the the subsequent observations 
and the transition matrix, uh, they will overwhelm typically this prior assumption. That's our prior distribution. And it will be overwhelmed commonly. The second thing I'd say is you could make use of a prior which is simply determined by, it's not here, but it, it could be determined by what fraction of the time if you posit this transition structure, you could figure out what fraction of the time is it in one state versus another in a simple, with a simple mathematical calculation. Um, and one of the uncertainties uh, that I've got to resolve for the take home exercises, whether I ask you to do this, but it's not hard to basically arrive at a situation where we say, oh, okay, given these transition probabilities, I spend on average such and such amount of time here and you know, uh, one minus that uh, here. Um, so we could, we could assume that. Okay, now um, the idea is over time, we're gonna have a set of observations. Um, and we're gonna go through some of these in great detail coming up here um, to explicate the math. But the idea is that for each, successive time point, uh, we are going to have some observation made. And that is going to clue us in um, tentatively to what state we're in. And then there'll be a transition modeled, which could go either direction. And, and our calculations will take that into account. And then we're going to have a successive observation, and we're going to we're going to be clued in in our judgment about what state we're in, and and then we're going to apply a possible transition. If the likelihood is extremely high of going to a certain state, um, uh, that's going to increasingly make us think we're probably in that state. But we're going to be corrected on an ongoing basis by these observations. And that basic insight is again, gonna carry over to all these subsequent methods um, or, or most of them, um, most notably with particle filtering and particle MCMC. Um, here we're, we're going to be positing what the underlying state is, but each new observation is going to clue us in better to what it is. The model dynamics is gonna push us to certain interpretations, but our interpretation is gonna be constantly corrected by those observations. It's gonna be constantly regrounded with these observations. Okay. Um, so at any one time, there's going to be uh, a secret state, which we don't observe, uh, but we're going to be trying to infer based on what we know this, this uh, trend or what we're positing the transition matrix is and based on these observations. And jointly, they're going to lead us to try to, to, to give us best guesses into what state we're in at any one time. But we're always gonna have a certain probability of thinking we're in one state versus another. This is the basic idea here. Um, there is some true underlying state and we're trying to clue into what it is based on this, oops, this posited structure of the system and these noisy observations. Um, so for example, here, um, if we, um, sorry, uh, boom. Um, uh, if we're in a, uh, a non-outbreak state here, state A, uh, for example, um, uh, we might, no, through the transition matrix, we have a 90% probability of staying in that state, right? Um, um, and so we will tend to think we're going to stay there. If, 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 if we were here last time, we're going to be pretty, pretty uh, confident we're going to stay there. And if then we see an observation that is on the low side, that's going to further our conviction that we're still in state A. Um, we're still in the non-outbreak state. And then um, if, if we think it's likely we're still in the non-outbreak non -outbreak state, we, we are 
confident with 90% probability, we're probably still going to remain there. So we're still reasonably confident that we're going to be in it the next time. We're very confident here because not only did we transition, or did we think it was very likely we we're going to transition to it, but our observation was consistent with it. This next time we get an observation here, which could be readily explained by non-outbreak, but it could also be explained fairly readily by an outbreak uh, distribution. But overall, uh, it's more consistent with a non-outbreak. It's quite close to the peak there. Um, the probability of observing it with a non-outbreak state is much higher than that for an outbreak state. Um, and uh, this should be P of B, excuse me. Um, that should be P of B. Um, B, B, okay. Um, okay, um, but if we're here, we might think by the transition matrix, we're still likely to, to remain here. Um, but in fact, um, uh, there is some chance that we'll move to this other state. It's low, but if we then see an observation, say up around 2026, 20, that is much more consistent with an outbreak state than an non-outbreak state. It, it would have very low probability of occurring with this non-outbreak distribution here. That will give us great credibility. We're now in an outbreak state. Um, and uh, we are taking into account the underlying system is changing at every point. There's always this chance we've transitioned but we're also developing conviction as to where we are by the observations. Okay, so let's go look at this through uh, a symbolic and a quantitative lens, okay? Um, so the idea here is that we're going to be computing up, we're going to be um, calculating over time, a probability of observing a given sequence. Um, maybe we could take, for the moment, capital T to be where we are now. Um, uh, so we're taking into account the probability of observing X1 through XT. These are the observations from the world. We see a certain number of clinical cases for time one, for time two, for time three, all the way to time T. Um, and what we wanna know is um, uh, if we are in, the a given state, um, what, what's the probability that we, um, oh, sorry, what, what's the probability of being in a given state in light of these, um, these observations? So we've made these observations and what's the probability we're, we're, we're now in a given state? Um, this is, what we're going to be be working to compute here. Um, and it's gonna be based on a calculation like this. this these are our two, two key components. This is just written more succinctly like this. And this sums it, uh, sums it up. This is actually the probability of observing it in any state if we multiply it by these ones. Um, so pi, you may recall, is the, the uh, prior distribution. That's the probability of being in an initial state. And the P of one is actually a diagonal matrix where each element on the diagonal, say the ith element, is the probability of observing um, uh, the, the, the given um, observation in, in each of these uh, successive states. Um, so like the, the, so in other words, P uh, for X sub two would be the likelihood, excuse me, the probability of having observed the second observation uh, in, in, in a given uh, state. So each of those elements that I diagonal would say for different states, what's the probability we would have observed 16? Um, X sub two indicates observation at time two. And this is a diagonal matrix, each of whom diagonal tells you what's the probability that 
if we were in state such and such, uh, say for the ith diagonal element in state i, that we would have observed that 60, that second observation. Um, uh, and, and gamma here, which we'll be seeing is the transition matrix. So between each observation and the next, we're gonna have some chance of transitioning. And if the transition matrix says, we're certainly going to transition or with a very, very high likelihood, that's gonna, that's gonna um, make us uh, posit more greater likelihood that we'll now be in uh, a given state. But we're gonna temper that with an observation, um, which is gonna combine, which is gonna allow us to sort of triangulate between the observation we're having and where we think we are through the force of this uh, transition matrix. That's, that's the general idea. Um, uh, now it's notable um, that for a given T, this entire expression yields a value that's the probability of having observed sequence X1 through XT given the HMM. So um, if we do not take into account this final uh, column vector here, um, uh, it's going to be a vector whose elements, in this case, a row vector whose elements are, uh, are going to be successively the probability of having observed this sequence uh, given that we're now in a in a certain state um, and or and being in a certain state now if we sum them all up we we have the probability of having observed this sequence given the whole hmm and when you're trying to find the hmm that best matches the data best matches the patterns in the data best best accounts for these observations this this formula is going to be key because it's going to allow you to say for a given HMM, what's the probability that we will have observed or the likelihood we will have observed this sequence of observations, X1 through XT? There's gonna be certain HMMs that are gonna be completely inconsistent with that evidence. And there's gonna be some that are very consistent with the evidence. So let's go through this. Um, this is kind of an maybe seem in a, a forbidding or 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 uh, overwhelming an expression. I want to decompose it, and you'll find it's it's not that hard to understand. So we'll start with this pi. Um, I'm going to write uh, pi here, um, 0 0.75 and 0 0.25. You remember those were our chances of starting in state A or starting in state B. Um, and I mumbled and I said it didn't matter that much, but in practice, uh, once you're well into the sequence, um, but it's going to be where we start. Um, and uh, we're going to then take into account the first observation. Now, the first observation here is going to be 31. And, and apologies, I should, have, I should have been consistent in my notation. I overhauled these slides uh, and and I wanted to put this up here. Uh, instead, it's kind of over there still on the right, which I think is a bit confusing. So you can ignore that 31, but the basic idea is we have an observation right out of the bat. We have an observation. This is X1. This is our first observation. Um, and what we're going to compute here is uh, pi transpose. So, so that's just this matrix. Um, transpose times p of uh, p of x one, and you may recall that's a matrix uh, whose upper it's a two by two matrix. Reflect, in fact, we have two states, rows and columns, um, and uh, the element in the upper left would be p sub a of thirty one, and the uh, element in the lower right would be p sub b of thirty one. I've just written. The, the product of this, um, and it'll be 0.75 times. So basically, we think initially we have a 0.75 uh, chance, uh, 0.75 chance of being in state uh, A. That's the non-outbreak state. 
and 25% chance of being in state, uh, state B. Now we see this observation 31, and we're going to update this to reflect, well, given that observation, what's our new sense of where we are? This is the posterior distribution. Um, what's our new sense of, of, of where we're at? Um, so this is our prior before seeing any data. That's what prior means, it's prior to the data. And then we're going to update it, take into account the data. So, um, well, what, what does the data tell us? Well, the data is going to tell us that P sub A is much, much less than P sub B. Why do I say that? Because if you look P sub B, if we have a 31, P sub B has a reasonably high chance of 31. It's on the high side for B, but, but it's, it's readily possible here. Um, uh, but meanwhile, chance of getting 31, if we're in this a non-outbreak state, that's this distribution here, is vanishingly small. It's almost non-existent, right? It, it goes down. If we have a non-outbreak state, our cases tend to be lower. And probability that it's 31 is, is extremely small. So here we have uh, an updated sense of where we're at. This is 0.75, that was based on our original kind of guess about where we are on um, uh, original prior without knowing, we just said, well, we're probably in a non-outbreak state. The city spends more time in non-outbreaks than outbreaks. So 0.75 times this probability of having observed 31 being an A, which is gonna be really small here, um, and then the 0.25 of observing probability B um, uh, of 31 with, with uh, being in an outbreak state, that's P of B. And so that's going to be considerably larger. Now, you, you might say those don't sum up to one. And that's true. They don't sum up to one. To make them true probabilities, the probability of being, uh, of being in a given state uh, in light of this new data we'd have to sum these up. We'd have to take this vector and divide it by the sum of these two. Um, now, each of these entries we call alpha sub one um, with a superscript indicating the state. So this is alpha sub one A um, and alpha sub, sub, sub one B. And we're gonna use that notation here um, successively with the alpha. So we're, it's, it's an extremely, important element of what's called the forward backwards algorithm or the probability vector. Um, and it's the joint probability of, of observing the data to now and being in a certain, a certain state. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we're going to here um, uh, reflect the fact that since we took this data into account, even though this, this first one started much larger, three times the other size, um, you know, what we're going to arrive at is a situation where the second element is vastly larger than the first, because the probability of observing 31 with this uh, likelihood function, um, contingent on being in an outbreak state, the likelihood of observing 31 is so much higher for, the, for an outbreak state than for an non-outbreak we're going to actually emerge in a situation where this um, um, this component of the vector is going to be vastly larger than the other. And if we were to normalize it by the sum of the two, we'd see we have a very high probability um, in the posterior of being in an outbreak state. Okay, now um, let's continue to go on though, because um, of course, uh, we're going to be looking forward to the next observation. But before the next observation happens, before that occurs, something very important happens. Uh, we have a chance of transitioning. Uh, we may have pinned down that we're very likely in an outbreak state right now. But over the course of a week, a lot can change. Maybe, maybe we're going to go back to a non-outbreak state. Um, so we may have, you know, have very strong confidence we're in an outbreak state at this point, but 
if we want to know what's the case in the next week, um, we'll balance that. We have to balance that with the fact we may change. So let's see how that occurs, right? If, if we're very confident now from observing this 31, we're in this state. Well, we have some small chance of being there. But now, um, now we have this 30% chance per week. That's this 0.3 here of going from an outbreak state to a non-outbreak state. Oh boy. So we may have, you know, in last week been very confident in an outbreak state, but it's a very good, very decent chance. We may now for the next week yet be in a non-outbreak state. Um, and of course there was some chance, it was very, very small that we were in a non-outbreak state. That observation made us think that chance is very small, but it's not completely zero. And if we were in a non-outbreak state there, um, it's very likely we stayed there. So we need to take that into account. We're switching states potentially here. Um, and, and we need to take it into account. So how do we take it into account? Well, we use the transition matrix down here. Um, so let's, let's walk through the, the reasoning here. Um, so this was our probability vector um, jointly of, of all of, of making all these observations and being in a certain state after we observed this, uh, this last datum, this last observation. Okay, um, that was our posterior distribution. But it's in the nature of many Bayesian algorithms that what was our posterior for the last time point becomes our prior for the next. So this starts as our prior for the next one. That's our best guess as to what things are before we see the next observation. Um, and, uh, and now we have to take into account the probability of transitioning first. Before we can consider that next observation 16, we may have transitioned. And how does that, how does that affect things? Well, look, um, if uh, we're going to emerge with a probability of being in each state. Um, so state A and state B, that's what each of these rows are. This is the probability of being in state A and probability of being in state B. Okay. Um, so how could we be in state A in the next time point? Well, we can be in state A in two separate ways, right? We could have so state A is the non-outbreak state. How could we be at that by the next time point? Well, we, we could have been there the last time. Our, our assessment of that was very low chance because this was a very small value, but it is possible so that we were there. Um, and um, that contributes this probability uh, here, um, uh, alpha sub one A. This probability times um, is the probability we were in that state uh, during our last time point. And we multiply that times the probability of remaining in that state conditional that we were there, P of A to A. That's this one here. 90% um, chance if we were there. So 90% of this probability goes to contribute to that because we're still probably here. If we were there last time, we're still probably here. But then we have a, this probability that we were in state B for this time point, but now we've gone to state A. Those are two different ways in this, in, 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 that by this next time point, we could be in state A. This next week, we could be in state A. Either we were there already, we just were fooled by the data. It was a fluke. It was a chance, um, a thing out of left field that uh, an outlier, um, and, or, we were in state B indeed, as we surmised here based on the data, but we've transitioned. And, and gosh, the, the chance of going from B to A is 30%. So this is gonna actually contribute a lot more probability from this than, than this one is from, from this. Um, this probability is gonna be quite a bit larger than this one. And this is gonna be fully 30% of it from here. So that's two ways we could get to A by the next time point. And similarly, we could do it for B, right? How could we be in B the next time? Well, we could have been in A and 
and then we transition to B. Um, the chance of that from B to A is just 0.1. Uh, or we could indeed have been in B and we just stayed in B and it's 70% chance uh, times uh, this probability of having been there. So that's what this um, notation means. So when I showed you um, this notation, what we've just done is gone through the reasoning for this component. We started with a guess. We took into account the first observation. That made us very much surmise that we're probably in the outbreak state. But then we needed to take into account this transition matrix, which kind of shuffled things around and meant even if we really, really thought we were in an outbreak, now there's a good chance we're not in an outbreak anymore for the next week. And now that's the prior for, for this next state. And we're gonna take into account the observation for that, for that, next, um, that next time point, I should say, the next time point. So there we went. And now we're gonna take this one into account. Now this one, 16, could be explained uh, as very consistent with A. Wow, that looks very plausible for A. Um, but it's also possible for B. Um, and we're going to take that into account. So, so here, uh, we have to take this expression. That's what this whole thing is. That's this expression. What we thought the probability we were in before we saw the observation and we multiply it by the observation. Notice it's the same process we did here. This was the probability we surmised that we were in state A. And, and when we took into account the observation, we just multiplied by that, uh, uh, multiplied that by the probability, the likelihood of observing that observation. Um, so this is our prior, and we multiply it by the likelihood of observing the data conditional on being in state A and a similar thing here. And we're doing the exact same process here, except this is our probability, not 0.75, but this thing, um, that's our prior. And we multiply it by the likelihood, the, the, the likelihood that we observe 16, we observe data, conditional on being in this underlying state as P sub A. Um, so uh, that gives us a certain probability from P sub A, that's from this distribution, from this likelihood. Um, and then we have another likelihood from P sub B, which is somewhat smaller um, times this one. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the next component here where we combine that in. So I think you see what's happening here. Uh, each time we have a prior, we take into account a new observation that changes our sense of where we're at into a posterior. It's informed not only by our prior, but by our likelihood. And then we have to take into account the transition that just shuffles things in this linear way where we have a certain probability of staying in each state and a certain probability of going to each state. And it, um, it, it, it leads to you know, certain states becoming more likely because we could have transitioned into them. Um, and that becomes our prior for the, uh, for the next observation. So um, here we go. So here we have uh, phi sub one, and in, in, uh, being characterized by this vector, phi sub two by this one. That is our posterior distribution uh, here before making the transition. Then we make this, that's our problem. Then that's gonna give us our posterior distribution after making the transition. And we multiply it in the same way um, by this new observation. And that's gonna clue us in. So even if we were very, very confident at this stage with the first observation that we were in state B, despite a prior that told us probably otherwise, where we, we, we put aside that prior and said, oh, come on, the evidence speaks for itself. We were in state, state B. 
no matter what church prejudices I entered with, uh, that it was only a 25% chance, the evidence overwhelms that. But by the next time point, we're probably somewhere, you know, thinking it's a pretty good chance we're now in an on a break state. And then this 10 is going to probably pretty much clinch it, right? Um, where it's going to say, okay, we're probably now, we may have been in that outbreak state earlier, but uh, up here, but now we're very likely in a non outbreak state. And we go through and we successively compute these things, each time using the observations to go from a prior to a posterior before transitioning, transitioning using the transition matrix, that becoming our prior going into this state and then taking into account the new data. And so you'll notice that each of these is just more uh, larger and larger prefix of that fearsome looking expression here. This is nothing more than those iterations, um, reasoning about where we're at right now in light of observations and in light of transitions. But don't lose track of the fact for our subsequent discussions later this week, but uh, on Friday, but, but especially for particle filtering and particle MCMC, um, don't lose fact, the track of the fact that what's going on at a deeper level is we have a certain model in which we have a degree of confidence, but we also have data in which we have a, a certain degree of confidence. Both are very fallible. Both are ambiguous or uncertain, but we're balancing the two. Really, that's what's going on writ large here, right? We're, we're taking into account the model in the form of this transition matrix what it's telling us, but we're taking into account this data and what it's telling us. And even if the transition matrix told us, for example, we have a very high chance of now being in you know, uh, state, state B, once we see this new observation, it casts that into doubt. Um, and observations can, can um, overwhelm our sense of, of what the model thinks should be the case on its own. This is a process quite unlike traditional modeling um, where you know, we, we create a model and we run it out and we see the logical implications of that model. We say, you know, this is what we theorize is the case, go figure. And it, it, it you know, sends it out and we can compare it to data and we can adjust our parameter assumptions but, um, but basically it's the model consequences. Here we're actually cluing ourselves in to the probability over time that we're in this state or this state or that state. And this is gonna be bang on to what's gonna happen with particle filtering and particle MCMC with salient differences being that we're gonna be operating there not in discrete time, discrete weeks, but continuous time and not in discrete, with discrete states, but continuous states. Um, but we're going to be constantly re-examining what we think is going on based on the model dynamics and what we think is going on based on observations. And those are gonna update our sense of what's going on in the underlying model dynamics. Um, very different from calibration earlier where we don't have this going on during the model runs. We're not observing new data and cluing us in to what's the underlying state of the model. We're just playing out and finding the best match of parameters that play out. And that's what's gonna happen on Friday too. But then we're gonna transition to particle filtering and particle on CMC. Okay, so um, uh, conscious of the time here, what we've been computing here is the probability vector uh, alpha sub t. I, I wove that in of uh, the description here. It's the joint probability of, of observing um, all this data and being in a given state. If you wanna get the, the probability of being in a given state at a given time, you can just divide that I made a, a sort of a mumble towards this, uh, to this effect earlier. The marginal probability of being in state J at time T um, uh, 
you can just divide it by uh, the, if if all you've observed is till now, you could divide it by alpha, for example. Um, you could divide this probability alpha sub t divided by by um, uh, alpha, and that would give us a sense of. Uh, are we in this state or that state or that state? And they would sum to one. Um, so, so divided by the sum of alpha, excuse me, uh, sum up over all elements of alpha. Alpha is a vector. It tells us for each state, what's uh, this probability. And if we divided it here over the sum up uh, of these over all states, it will tell us the probability of being in state, a given state, in light of all this data that we've observed. Um, and of course, we could re simply rewrite this as, as this product. That's simply a, a kind of um, uh, cleaning that up notationally. Um, now, um, it goes to note, though, that reflective of kind of um, common practice or common circumstance, uh, where you're trying to observe where are we right now? What state are we in right now? Um, uh, you might only have data till now. Uh, we don't have data from the future given to us. And um, we can do that with just the alphas. And what we've been doing is, is exactly suitable for that. But there are times where we want to go beyond that. We'll see this for particle filtering, and we'll see it for particle MCMC um, as well. Um, they have exactly their analogs to this. They're much more sophisticated methods um, that are, that are uh, uh, going to be estimating continuous states. But like here, they're going to allow us to backcast, to ask, OK, in light of what came after this, were we in an outbreak state earlier? What, what was, what's the chance that we were in an outbreak at this earlier time? Um, in light of not only what came before, but what came after. Retrospectively, what was going on there? Um, that's what uh, we can calculate with beta. And the idea behind beta is, is quite similar to before. It's, it's actually just... Um, uh, this expression here, but we're working backwards um, from the, the final state. Um, so here we have the final observation. We have the transition um, that, that led to that. We have successively earlier observations all the way back to, but not including, T. And these are called backwards probabilities. Now that may sound confusing, but basically it's the probability of being in a certain state in light of later observations. Um, and it turns out that if we have alpha and beta, um, generally if we have beta, we're going to have alpha also. We're going to have observations before this time and observations after that time. And if you want to take all data into account before and after, um, you can just multiply these two, divide by the, the likelihood of ob observing x1 through xt, which is just alpha sub t times the row vector. I mean, alpha sub t is a, is a vector. And so Take a, the dot product with the row with the row vector of all ones just sums up all of its elements. So alpha times beta divided by the sum of all the alphas, all the alpha sub t for that given t. Um, that's a constant. It's going to give you the probability of being in state J at time t. Um, given all data before and after t. Um, so given retrospective data and data before that, what was that probability the person was, was uh, experiencing suicidal ideation at that time, or they were depressed, or they were sick with early stage coronavirus, or they, they had uh, Lyme disease? Uh, we, we can calculate that. Uh, 
in light of our, our model. So it's, it's to be emphasized that these depend on the actual data. Um, and uh, it does lead to the possibility of summing this up overall S sub T. It's the same data, but summing it up overall S sub T and, uh, and, and getting as a result alpha sub T times this row vector of ones, which will give us the likelihood of observing all of these data points given this model. Um, okay, so the forward backward algorithm that calculates alpha beta and calculates the marginal probability of being in state J at a given time um, in light of data after and before it uh, is one of the two biggest uses of these models. Um, it's to be able to calculate what was happening at this time. And we saw that that reduces to, to basically uh, just uh, a sort of degenerate portion of this where beta sub t is one for the case where we don't have later data, we adjust all these disappear. We just have one, um, one here and we end up basically getting uh, alpha sub t divided by alpha sub capital T um, which tells us uh, the probability of being in each state at this time. Uh, but there's another very popular use as well of these hidden Markov models. And this is called the Viterbi algorithm. And th the, the goal here is actually different. What we've seen thus far is ability to assess, gives us the ability to assess for each time point, the probability that we're in a certain state, either based on data till that point, up to and inclu including that point, or data before and after that point. Um, and that's very useful. We can assess at any one time what's the probability of being in a certain state. But that's, that's a, a viewpoint which isn't necessarily taking into account the particular sequence of states that, that is being undergone. It's not giving you a single most likely sequence of observations. Um, and if you think about it, um, it allows us to say at a given time, what state are we most likely in? Sure, uh, we just look at the highest probability state. Um, if we're considering data only to this point, we have alpha sub t divided by alpha sub capital T times uh, this row vector of ones. In other words, the sum of the alphas, and that will give us the probability we're in uh, a given state and we could take the largest one. Or if we have beta as well, we can compute this and take the largest such p. Um, the largest chance that we're in a given state yeah, uh, we could do that, but the sequence of, of states, the sequence of most likely states may not be a, a legal sequence, in fact. Um, it may not be a possible sequence according to the theory encoded by the model. Um, it could be the model has certain invariant rules that this only happens after this other thing that would be, be violated. Um, when you interpret each point in isolation. What the Viterbi algorithm gives you is the single most likely legal sequence um, of being in a state. Um, and uh, it, it may not, at a given time, uh, the, the, the inferred state may not be the one that at that time in isolation is the single most likely. Um, it may be a different one that is more or less forced by the surrounding states or, or is strongly, uh, strongly suggested by the, by the surrounding states. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the elements of the Viterbi algorithm, but for those who have encountered dynamic programming, either in an algorithms course or in a course on operations research or other areas, um, you'd probably be interested to know that Viterbi algorithm 
works through dynamic programming principles. Um, and it, it may seem prohibitive to find the single most likely sequence, you know, that we were in a non-outbreak, 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 outbreak, outbreak, non-outbreak, non-outbreak, outbreak, et cetera. It may seem very, very costly to compute that, but it turns out that it can be computed uh, with a great economy of, of computation. It's very straightforward to, to, uh, to calculate. And within your take-home exercise, I'm gonna ask you to run the Viterbi algorithm on uh, some data, uh, on uh, using an HMM and some data to find the single most likely sequence um, that, that's uh, come about. Um, okay. Um, so uh, a few, uh, as, as we're running out of time here, a few um, caveats here. Um, if we have continuous states, and if we have memory full states, um, states that we can't just subdivide to make the memory list, um, uh, we are, um, we're, we're limited with HMMs. Uh, uh, continuous states are particularly a common need in infectious disease modeling. Um, we may be interested in labeling whether someone's infected by coronavirus or not, or whether they're contagious or not, uh, whether they are observing public health restrictions or not based on mobility data. And we can use an HMM to estimate those discrete questions. But when it comes to how many people in the population are infected or susceptible or undiagnosed or, or are currently asymptomatic or what have you, um, uh, we're dealing with the continuous state question. And um, generally an HMM won't be the best match for that. Um, and it turns out they're kind of at the boundary of system science techniques. They're, they're not nonlinear. Um, they are linear models. Um, and uh, it, it stands out in the, the very equations characterized here. Um, this is not a, a nonlinear method. It's a linear method. We have a linear transition matrix. And there's nothing shameful about that. It's just that when it comes to communicable disease, infectious disease, one of its defining features is that it, it deals with nonlinearities. My chance of being affected is not some probability per day um, independent of who's around me. By definition, what makes it a, an infectious disease is my chance of being infected depends on the infection status of, of another. Um, and uh, that is uh, a component that is not directly um, characterized here. Um, so we're going to be transitioning to dynamic models on, on, on Fridays coupled with, uh, with techniques. Now, Friday is a little bit it's going to be a little bit of a unusual one in the sense there's a bit of retrograde motion. And I kind of really sweated what order to put these things in. What we're going to be talking about on Friday with approximate Bayesian computation is more akin to a kind of a generalization of calibration than it is to what we see with HMMs. With HMMs, we're constantly rejudging really what the state is of the system based on the observations. We saw it earlier. We, we've got this, this belief from the transition matrix and from what was the case earlier where we probably are, and then we get, wham, we get a new observation and that updates our belief. And that takes us forward. And then we consider the, the dynamics of the system with tau, and wham, we get a new data, and that regrounds our understanding. Um, and uh, dynamical systems allow us to take this to a general level, particularly with nonlinearity. Um, uh, and there, we're going to have transition probabilities, like the force of infection, the probability per unit time I'm going to get infected, which depend on the state of the system. We're going to have continuous states, continuous time. Um, 
And with ABMs, we're going to have some additional possibilities in terms of context. So that's where we're going with this. Friday, um, we're going to be dealing with something that's more, more akin to a generalization of calibration. We're not going to be constantly regrounding based on new observations. So much as kind of getting the model sampling parameters so that they're most cons the model behavior is most consistent with observed data, but sampling them from a full distribution. It's with particle filtering and particle MCMC that we're going to be jumping into next week that this analogy to HMMs is going to sort of uh, be full blown. Um, but it's going to be kind of a generalization of HMMs that are going to take them to continuous time, continuous state, um, nonlinear models, and, uh, and inferring uh, about the state of the system in a more powerful way beyond what's possible with maximum likelihood. Uh, shares that much with uh, approximate Bayesian computation. Okay. Um, so that's all we have for today. I hope that's a little bit um, a little bit more understandable than what we saw last time in terms of the examples. But I will uh, look forward to talking with any of you within office hours. Uh, and I hope to get the take home exercise to you shortly so we could pursue that uh, in R with some example uh, HMM calculations. Thanks very much. I'll be right back for office hours, uh, five or 10 minutes here.